Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. Uh, I grew up in East Albany. Uh, my family's been there since the 1870s. Five, I'm the fifth generation. I'm a builder. I've had my own business for over 40 years. I have served on the Lake Region High School Board, and I was the vice chair of the board, and I was also the chair of the finance committee. I was on the Albany Select Board. I was the chair of that board, and really liked uh, setting the budget in that role. And I was on the Orleans Country Club Board of Directors, also on the budget committee for that. Um, I'm running because I feel that I can represent the voters of my district and bring their voice to the legislature. And the years of working in my own trades and working on these different boards has given me the ability to communicate with people and I believe I can communicate the message to the other legislatures. I grew up in Vermont. My grandfather was the state treasurer when George Aiken was the uh, governor. My dad uh, worked for uh, was worked uh, for Dick Snelling. He was the deputy commissioner of agriculture for quite some time. Um, I went to the, I went to Vermont public schools. I went to the University of Vermont, and then I went to law school in Washington at Georgetown. Um, I've always been interested in government. When I left law school, I came to Montpelier um, and uh, began uh, my career. I was walking down the street one day and I bumped into a fellow who said he thought I was a good lawyer and I asked him why. He said, well, your father told us you were a good lawyer. And I said, well, that's, that's interesting because I don't have any clients. Um, and he said, well, come up and see me. And it turned out uh, he owned a ski area. And I spent the next 25 years as an attorney representing ski areas in, in Montpelier. Um, I, uh, uh, so I worked in front of virtually every uh, agency in state government, uh, spent quite a bit of time working with the state legislature. Um, I uh, got sidetracked organizing student exchange programs and spent a great deal of time organizing teacher student exchange programs. I. Um, uh, after I retired, I spent a lot of time uh, continuing to work with the legislature, especially on education issues and wildlife issues. Um, a seat opened up in our district, and I felt like I could accomplish a lot more on those issues that I was the most concerned with, uh, having a seat at the table. And so with an open seat, I decided I would run. I am running for the Vermont House because I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom and I'm raising two kids here now and I love this community that we're from and I want it to be sustainable enough for them to be able to raise their families here. Way back, I think it was maybe September or October, Catherine Sims, who is our current representative, actually recruited me to run when she decided that she was going to run for Senate. And I think that from having gotten to know me on the select board in Glover where I served for three years and through my other work as an educator in a public school, I've worked at Hazen Union in our public school system for the last 12 years, or actually this year will be my 12th year. She respected the values that I have when it comes to our small town schools, education, making this a great place to raise a family. and. 
In thinking about why I wanted to run, those are the kinds of things I thought about, is what do we really need? It's becoming a lot harder for people to afford to live here. Kids that grew up here can't afford housing. They can't always access the education or the jobs that they want. Older people can't afford to live here once they're on fixed incomes. And so I thought about what was best for my family and the future of my family and everyone's families. And it seemed like running was a good idea to try and fix those things. Well, we've spoken to this in a couple different forums. Uh, one of the things we have to realize is that this uh, particular area of Vermont is not quite the same as the areas of more populated areas. So we are in a situation where there's not a lot of money floating around. So when the legislature votes in these bills that are raising taxes for people up here, it makes it very difficult for some people to make ends meet. So in regards to solving that problem, we have to make sure that all these budgets that are prepared statewide are being monitored very well so that the money is being spent where it should be and spent wisely and there's no waste. If everybody could come up with a cut on their every department, it might cut back on taxes. When you can't raise any revenue in any business or in your own home, you have to cut back on your expenses. Obviously, what we're doing today isn't sustainable. 8% tax increase last year, 13.8% this year for our property taxes. Um, that that uh, formula will not work going forward. There's a lot of things I think we can do. Um, first of all, uh, our classroom has changed. It's no longer just a classroom. It's uh, Our classrooms have become, uh, to a large extent, social service institutions. And a lot of what we're doing in the classroom uh, needs to be reconsidered. Uh, should it be on the shoulders of a property tax, or should it be moved to a more progressive uh, general fund and income tax. So I think that's a, a, a conversation and a study that needs to happen. I think the uh, education funding formula is far too complicated. School boards can't work with it. Uh, it needs to be simplified. Um, I also think that um, we need to consider a, a new form of consolidation. We have 63 supervisory unions. Those are expensive. That's a very top-heavy bureaucracy. The notion of uh, consolidating school districts, I think, was a mistake. I don't, it obviously hasn't saved any money, but I do think we can, we can find some savings by consolidating supervisory unions. I think that one of the things that we could look at, which a lot of people are beginning to talk about, is paying for our schools with an income-based tax versus a property tax. Especially in rural areas like the Northeast Kingdom, people are much more often land rich than cash rich. And the cost of living and the cost of education is increasing at a rate that our incomes are not. So people that can afford a little more maybe need to start putting a little more in the pot because we can only gather as much money as people have. And we don't want to force our farm families out of here and people that have a little land we're seeing people actually have to move away. And the answer is not, oh, well, if you can't afford it, then just sell your land to someone that can afford that land. The answer is to really look at some systemic changes. How can we do things differently? I think as far as cutting services in schools, the need for services is going up. There are actually not a lot of places to cut. And just like inflation is hitting everything else, it's hitting education as well. But how we pay for those services, I think, is what can be looked at. And another thing is that a lot of the human services, I think, that are provided at schools, because that's where we can find kids, maybe don't necessarily need to come out of the education fund, but could come out of a general fund a little bit more as well. So those are the kinds of things that I think that we can look at. And as we spoke to this the other night at the Crassberry Forum, my question is, my answer to that is a question, and then I'll try to put that in perspective. I really don't know when people say they mean affordable housing, what is affordable? Uh, do we need a four bedroom, two bath, two car garage house? Or can we start with something smaller 
And then as our family grows or our needs change, we change that living arrangement. So right now we're in a very high real estate boom. Things are very expensive. I feel real estate always goes in waves. I think the prices will come back down and maybe make it affordable for most people. But again, if it's really hard to figure out how to make housing affordable if you raise a tax to subsidize housing to get people into that do you also raise a tax to subsidize they're making the payments on that property you have to be careful on raising money to help people get started because if they can't get started on their own it might be tough for them to keep what they get so we have to be careful about how we subsidize housing if that's the choice well, I think there's two dimensions to that question. One is making housing attainable, uh, especially for the young families with children that our businesses depend on and need uh, uh, here in this area. I also think we have a, a homeless uh, 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 challenge. We have people uh, that simply don't have homes. And I think we need to uh, do a handful of things with the how we have a lot of housing stock that is sitting idle that needs uh, to be restored. Uh, and what I would do is expand tax holidays for people that are willing to renovate those that housing and turn it into multiple apartments. I would create four or five year tax holidays because quite frankly, we would add a substantial amount of money to our uh, uh, grand list. Uh, and I think towns would be better off in the long run uh, if we rehabilitated those houses. Um, but I think we, we need to reconsider how we are, and oh, I would also look at zoning because I think zoning's been a big hurdle in some towns like Greensboro. 10 acre zoning does not work in today's uh, housing market. But I think we should also uh, consider uh, how are we gonna solve the problems of people that don't have homes at all? And uh, putting them uh, at $80 a night in uh, inns like the Cortina Inn in Rutland where you don't even have any kitchen facilities, I don't think is the answer to that problem. And I think one of the things we can do is look at, cre at, at creating communities of tiny homes, tiny houses. Um, at $80 a night, if that's what we're paying for a single person uh, at the Cortina, that's $2,400 a month. Um, that's a, a, a $300,000 mortgage. Um, we could be doing a lot more with the money that we're spending now in ways that I don't think are particularly uh, uh, long-term effective in terms of address, help, helping families or people without homes. And I think we should consider creating communities of tiny houses and uh, finding a better solution. I think that all of these issues are really connected. For instance, if we want to raise more taxes, another solution is to have a bigger tax base to get more people to live here. But as people are coming to live here, the big question arises, where can they live when there's nowhere to rent or nowhere to buy? I know that working within the school system, we've hired people that actually haven't been able to find a place to live and have had to give up the jobs that we just offered them. And even more importantly, the kids that are growing up here can't always find housing. Or um, tragically, I've heard stories in the past few weeks of women that needed to leave their home suddenly and didn't have a place to go. So all of these are big problems. I think that there are a number of things we can do. One is that we can look at raising more tax revenue from second homes and vacation homes. We can make it easier for people to put the ADUs, the auxiliary dwelling units on their houses. Um, a recent survey found that one of the reasons that people are reluctant to um, put ADUs on their homes is because Vermont landlord laws sometimes favor people who are not necessarily the greatest renters more than they favor landlords. So I think that if we could make some adjustments to those laws, maybe people would be more comfortable with that. We could help um, with some funding for adding what sometimes people call in-law apartments. And we can also support services that already exist like Habitat for Humanity or Rural Edge that are trying to both buy up land and um, buy up um, buildings that are underutilized to make them into housing. 
Greensboro is a place where that conversation is happening a lot. The conversation maybe is not finished yet. A lot of people in Greensboro actually want to talk more about whether or not the town hall actually should become middle and low income apartments. But that kind of idea, whether that is specifically what happens in that town or not, is the kind of thing that we need to look at is where can we find these empty houses? And for instance, if you go from Glover to Barton, you'll see a ton of them that aren't being used anymore. And how can we make those into housing? So I think all of those things combined need to do this. That's a subject that I'm not really very versed in. I would like to get some more facts before I make a really hard statement on that. Uh, that's a question I haven't really been asked yet or, or dealt with. Um, homelessness is becoming a problem, not so much in this area, but more in the, po in the populated areas. There are homeless people here, and there may be more homeless people if, we, if they can't afford to keep their homes because of high taxes. So, I don't know, shelter somewhere that maybe we can make available. And on a temporary basis until we get someone in a home. And we also have to find out why this person is homeless. Is there ways we can help them get themselves out of homelessness and get there into their own place? Well, I, I would add to it that um, when we talk about people without homes in Vermont, it's a really complicated question because people without homes include People like the executive director of the Highland Center for the Arts, who can't find a home, um, uh, who, uh, something that's affordable. I think that uh, uh, what we need to do is re-examine how we're spending money and uh, begin thinking about creating new communities where we're not just talking about big, big 2,000, 3,000 foot homes, and we're not talking about $300,000 homes, but where we're talking about communities of tiny homes. Well, again, we need to provide more low income and rural, uh, sorry, middle income housing in rural areas. That's one solution. Another solution, though, is not just to look at that as a separate problem, but to look at all of these problems and how they're connected. So looking at systems, Instead of saying, what should we do about homelessness to get more people housing, we should say, what should we do about homelessness to make it so that people don't end up in homelessness in the first place? And that's looking at addiction. It's looking at um, mental health. It's looking at jobs. It's looking at cost of living. It's different things for different people or some combination of all of those things for people. But starting to solve the issues at that level, not just when people become homeless, is what we need to do. I don't think that all solutions are a solution that's going to happen in one legislative term. I think that sometimes we need to look at the solutions that are going to happen over a generation as we start to change systems. That's an excellent question. When you lose proceeds, it's hard to maintain a budget that you have. So you would have to find some way to maybe make up the difference on the gas tax and somehow tax the electric vehicle accordingly to bring that balance back and these two storms that we've had in the last two years were very devastating and we don't know if we're going to have more storms like that to cause that kind of damage in the next 50 years or the next two years so it's really hard to predict what kind of monies we're going to have to have to support our road budget well first of all this is a long-term solution. It won't be an immediate answer, but I have some faith in S-259, uh, the so-called Superfund bill. And uh, the fact of the matter is, the six biggest oil companies in the country made uh, $219 billion in profits uh, two years ago. Um, the, uh, I think uh, ExxonMobil made about $36 billion in profits this year and about $56 billion in profits last year. And they are largely responsible for the problems that Greensboro is facing. Greensboro paid a million dollars to fix af our, our stormwater system after the flood last year. We're going to spend about 750000 this year. And it seems to me reasonable to expect those companies, um, if they can pay their CEOs $36,000 a year, $36 million a year, then they ought to be able to help us with our uh, uh, costs 
for some of the problems they've created. And so I've got some faith in uh, that effort. Uh, it's going to be a long, complicated lawsuit. It's not going to answer our problems immediately. I know that there's going to be a substantial amount of money coming to the state from the Inflation Reduction Act. And what I would suggest is that our towns get together and cooperate and hire people that can do the paperwork and deal with the bureaucracy, the huge bureaucracy it takes to get that funding that we need to rebuild our stormwater systems. Uh, our planning commissions have to do a lot of risk assessments. Uh, our select boards are going to have to do a lot of uh, new planning, uh, but it is incumbent on us to be prepared because these extreme storm weather events are going to continue to happen. So long term, we need to look at how we're going to have some of the very prosperous uh, fossil fuel uh, companies uh, pay for this, uh, and uh, we're going to have to uh, work more closely together as towns and with the federal government to access uh, funding uh, immediately. Well, already they're starting to look at how people who drive electric vehicles can contribute to that infrastructure now that they're not paying gas taxes. And I've even known people who drive electric vehicles that at first said, oh, that's totally unfair, but then started to realize why we needed to make those changes. So that's one answer. Um, I think that also we need to really start looking at mitigating climate change to respond to these events in ways that both try and slow down climate change as well as building back more structurally so that when they do happen, they're not gonna be as destructive. What we were calling 100 year floods for so long, at least based on last year, are now one year floods. Are they gonna get to be sooner than that? I don't know. But we need to look at the way that we're constructing um, and we need to also look at what kind of infrastructure we're gonna put in place if we do make that switch to electric vehicles. I don't think it's something that should be forced on people, but I am in support of that kind of a change. It's going to involve more charging stations. It's going to involve better rural electric vehicles. I know that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to drive electric vehicles. So I think looking at all of that. Well, they, I think Vermont's got the laws in place that were voted on and uh, it seems to be not such a controversy anymore, but I'm going to just come out and say it's, it's an individual situation. And some of these abortions that are carried out are, yes, it's, it is not, if you're a religious person, you're not supposed to interrupt life, but sometimes it's best if the person that is involved with this has a choice to decide whether this is going to affect their life in a negative way. Well, I think that Vermont has pretty much addressed that issue with the constitutional amendment that we passed. Um, I personally felt the Dobbs decision was a big mistake. Um, I, I think that uh, Roe v. Wade was a good decision. It should have been left alone. I think that uh, um, we are at a point, though, in Vermont where we have said that uh, uh, women's reproductive rights are issues that need to be resolved between women and their doctors. And uh, I think that's the appropriate uh, way forward. I am so glad that Vermont has already passed a constitutional amendment to protect our rights for reproductive freedom. And I think this is something that the United States as a whole needs to pass. I think that it is nobody's business and too often we get into this topic of, well, what about exceptions for you know, incest, or what about exceptions for rape? And yes, in abortion law, there should be those exceptions, but in fact, there should be no abortion law. It doesn't matter if you're a married woman who already has five children. It doesn't matter if you are a college graduate that has the money to support a baby. If women don't wanna have children, women don't have to have children. This is their right. And I think that the argument that, oh, it should be states' rights is so ridiculous. Well, okay, fine, maybe states should be deciding. But even better, what about individual towns? Even better than that, what about individual women? That entire logic goes back down to it's nobody's business except for the women themselves. It should be individual women that are deciding this. And the fact that it's being decided by a Supreme Court that has been stacked for their conservative religious viewpoints is anti-American. 
We should also be protecting women who need to get out of states where they can't access abortions. We should make it easy for women to come to Vermont. They should feel safe or to any other state where they can get an abortion. And there should be no legal consequences for helping women that want to access health care. And furthermore, the people that are talking about abortion seem to have no interest in actually supporting the children that are born after they're born. So it's completely hypocritical. I feel very strongly about that. Uh, I guess I'd like to use this time to uh, kind of clarify some things that have, I want people to understand. And uh, as far as addressing, a, there's been some suggestions to further tax vacation homes or second homes, as, as they call them. Uh, I think most towns already do tax those second homes at a higher rate. And I'm not real sure that that's the best way to go. We, again, we've, we've, it's hard enough for people to pay their taxes. And just because it might be your second home doesn't necessarily mean that you are financially able to pick up another expense added on to what you've already planned to do. And then the uh, issue of a, a luxury tax, I'm a little concerned that I, I, I do not agree with the luxury tax. When do you decide what's a luxury and what isn't? What's the, what line do you cross before you become subject to that tax? And in time, is that line going to move because we've used up all the people that have luxuries and now they don't have luxuries anymore. It's very, you, it's really hard to take something away from somebody that they might have worked very hard for and give it away to someone else. So I'm not really for a luxury tax. I stated this the other night and I want to just make sure that people understand who I am. When you are a candidate and you get your email address out there, you're going to get a lot of replies and incentives to they want to sell you signs they want to sell you a arrangement where they can mass text people or sell you flyers and you can even take a course to become a better politician they will tell you how to speak to the talking points what issues to address and how do they to address them and how to speak and how to be i'm not going to do that what you see is what you get well, I think uh, for me, uh, I, I grew up in a, uh, a family that was uh, very much damaged by alcoholism and substance abuse, but I was very, very fortunate to have a great high school teacher and uh, who took me under his wing and uh, urged me to join the debate team, and as a result of that, I went to college. Uh, with a scholarship, and as a re result of that, I went on to law school. And so education is extraordinarily important to me. Um, I think that uh, if we are going to deal with uh, some of the problems we have today of substance abuse and generational poverty, we need to focus our attention on making our schools as good as they could possibly be. Um, I personally think that uh, we live in a world that's torn apart by war. Uh, we can see it in Sudan, in Ukraine, and in the Middle East, and I think one of the things we need to do is create more opportunities for our high school students to be involved globally, not just locally. I'd like to see I'd like to see many, many, many more students participate in exchange programs with other countries, even exchange programs with other states. I'd like to bring more students from foreign countries to Vermont, and I'd like to bring more students from Vermont to foreign countries, and I'd like to build that understanding. Um, I really am excited to do this work for a really long time. I want to see a sustainable Northeast Kingdom where the kids that grew up here can live here as long as they want to. I'm not trying to change much about our culture. I, sus I respect our Northeast Kingdom culture, our hunting laws. The things that I want to change are about affordability. I'm not looking to develop our state into a place that it's not. I'm looking to make it work for all people people on fixed incomes, people that are growing up now and um, becoming the careers that they want to be. I think that includes looking also at expanding broadband internet, solving issues of our digital divide. 
Um, there's a lot of people with no access to computer skills and computers themselves that are not prepared for a 21st century education or a 21st century career or need access to health. And I think that one thing to know about me is that I want to look at systems as a whole and I want to not just change sort of individual laws that might think, make things easier for people, but look at how all of the issues that we deal with are interconnected and how we can actually change our culture, change our systems in ways that make it easier for everybody to live here long term and create generations of change.